Hi everyone, Anthony Morganti here. Today's video is another video in a series of videos I'm doing on Topaz Labs, Denoise AI, Sharpen AI, Gigapixel AI, and Photo AI. In these videos, I'm demonstrating how to best use these four applications as standalone apps and as plugins in Lightroom and Photoshop. I've already completed four videos in this series. I completed all the videos on Denoise AI, and I did one video on Sharpen AI. So far, I demonstrated how to use it as a Lightroom plugin. In today's video, I'm going to demonstrate how to use Sharpen AI as a Photoshop plugin. I have all of these videos together in a playlist. The link to that playlist will be in the description below this video. All right, let's get started. How to best use Sharpen AI as a Photoshop plugin. As you can see, I have Photoshop open. I'm just going to open up a file. I have one right on my desktop. It's an icon raw file. We'll open it up. Now, because it is a raw file, when you open it up into Photoshop, it will open up directly into Camera Raw. If you're working on anything other than a raw file, it will instead open up into Photoshop. Now, since this is a raw file and it's in Camera Raw, I'm going to do some editing to it before I sharpen it. And I'm going to undo some stuff to it as well. What I'm going to do over here on the basic side here, I'm just going to edit tone. So I'm going to bring highlights down. I'm just going to do this very quickly. All right. So I'm not going to be too careful about this. I'm going to get a white point and I'm going to get a black point. And then I'm not going to add any texture or clarity. That's important. Do not add any texture or clarity at this point. Also, try to avoid doing anything with dehaze. Now, this image doesn't need anything with dehaze, but if you had a landscape image and you may be tempted to move dehaze if it's hazy, or maybe you want to add haze, move it to the left. But try to avoid doing that because Sharpen works best on images that aren't manipulated with haze at all, one way or the other. That's my finding, at least. I'm not going to do anything with vibrance or saturation at all. So I just did tone. Now, what I want to do, though, is I want to jump down to optics, and I want to just make sure these boxes are checked so that I'm correcting uh, for the lens I used. This was a DSLR. Uh, sh this photo was shot with a DSLR. If you have a mirrorless camera, you probably don't have to worry about that. Let's go to detail. Now, by default, my camera raw file, when I load it into either Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, it will automatically add some sharpening to the raw file. Take that down to zero. You don't want Lightroom to do any sharpening at all. I found that Sharpen AI works best on a RAW file that isn't already sharpened by Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. Noise reduction. Well, if it is noisy, get some rid of some of the noise. It isn't too noisy. So I'm going to move uh, luminance noise reduction. That's what this first noise reduction slider is. Move it up there. It looks pretty good. Now, if you have a very, very noisy image, you may have to use Denoise AI. In that case, I do have videos on how to use Denoise AI as a Photoshop plugin. You would do that before you sharpen it. So I refer you to that playlist that is located in the description below this video. In there, look for the video I do where I'm demonstrating how to use Denoise AI as a Photoshop plugin. Get rid of the noise first with Denoise AI, then uh, edit the image uh, to sharpen it with Sharpen AI. So this image, though, isn't very noisy, so I'm able to just use uh, Camera Raw's noise reduction. Put it at 25, that's good for color, and 25 for this is luminance noise reduction. So that's it. That's all you got to do. That's all you're going to do. So I'm ready. I'm going to open it up and do Photoshop. I'm ready to sharpen it now. Now, if I just open it up into Sharpen AI right now, it'll work great, and I'll be able to sharpen it. But it bakes the settings in. So if I needed to go back in and re-edit thing, anything, I wouldn't be able to do that. So what you want to do is you want to make the layer you're going to be working on a smart object. Now, we don't want to do it to the background layer. We always want to keep our background layer kind of pristine, just in case we screw up something and sharpen AI or we decide later we don't like it. We could just then delete the layer that Sharpen AI was done on and revert back to the background layer. So duplicate the background layer by hitting Command or Control J. So we have that. Now I mentioned 
If I do still send this over there and do any editing on it in Sharpen AI, it gets baked in. Those settings get baked in. I want to be able to re-edit it. So I'm going to make this a smart object. There's a number of different ways to do it. The way I typically will do it, I'll just go up to filter and I'll go right here, convert for smart filters. And when I do that, you'll see there's a little square in the corner here. That means this layer is now a smart object. Now, any filter I do to it, at least most any filter, I'll be able to go back in and re-edit that filter because this is now a smart object. So let's do it. Let's go up to filter, down to Topaz Labs, and over to Sharpen AI. Now it'll open up this layer into Sharpen AI. Now, you know, I've talked about this many times. Typically, what I like to do is start out with these apps and call what's called comparison view. If you look at the top, you can see there's a number of different views. There's uh, single view, split view, side-by-side -side view, and comparison view. I like to be in comparison view, and the reason why is in the case of Sharpen AI, there's a number of different Sharpen models. If you look over here, you can see that there are actually 10 up here. And actually, if you want to quibble, standard, there's actually two different standard models. There's a lens blur model and a motion blur model. So there's technically 11. So what I like to do is go to comparison view. The problem with using comparison view, though, is you lose the ability to have Topaz Labs suggest to you which one of these models is the best model. You have to be in single view for that. And to do that, just turn the switch on. Then you'll allow uh, Topaz Lab Sharpen AI to choose what it feels is the best model. In this case, autofocus normal, it feels is the best model. It's been my experience that it will rarely pick the model that I feel is best. So that's why I don't like to do this. I prefer to go to comparison view. And when I do that, you'll notice it turned that switch off. And now we have four different models on the screen at one time, four of the 10 or 11, if you want to count standard as two different models. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, navigator rectangle and move it around a little bit, kind of see some good parts of the bird that I want to see. I want to see the eye and I want to see the cheek. And you have to wait for everything to re-render. The top left-hand corner is the standard model. It happens to be on auto. I like everything to be on auto to begin with, so I'm comparing things more equally. Uh, to the right of that, I have the motion blur, very blurry model. That, too, is on auto. In the lower left, I have autofocus very blurry, and that too is on auto. And in the lower right, I have two soft very blurry, and that too is on auto. Now, typically what I'll do is I'll determine, with these all being on auto, which one is the worst. And just looking, it looks like two soft very blurry is the worst. So then what I'll do is I'll make sure that one's active by clicking on it. And then you can tell it's active. It has this blue box here, and also it's selected over here. Then I'll just click on other ones, and it will swap whatever is in this active box or whatever I click on. For example, uh, we have over here motion blur, very blurry, right? Well, what does motion blur normal look like? So we'll click on that and it will swap this bottom right hand one out for that. And you can see what that looks like. And that actually looks pretty good, but I think maybe motion blur, very blurry is a little better. So we could try very noisy, but these aren't noisy. So I don't think these are applicable. So I would skip all the noisy ones. That is, you know, worried about that. Let's go to um, out of focus normal, which I don't think I have anywhere, and see what that looks like. And then that's not very good. So you just click around. I'm not going to waste the time and figure out maybe one of these might be better than another. But just looking at them, the standard model, click on that and make that active. On auto looks pretty good. The motion blur, very blurry model on auto looks very good. Let's go back to the standard model for a minute. Let me just try motion blur. Click on that. It takes it off auto. Let it render. Okay, and that one's pretty good as well. As a matter of fact, that one might be the best. See how it doesn't seem to always pick the best one, even when you're on the auto up here or in auto settings here. But that one to me looks pretty good. So I've determined that this one is the best one. This is standard with the model parameters on motion blur. Um, so what I'm going to do now is go to single view. All right, let it render. Now we have a lot of pixels to render now because it's, you could see, zoomed out a little bit more. So it takes a little longer to render. 
and it looks pretty good. If you want to get a before after, just left click with the left mouse button. There's before and there's after. You know, it might be over sharpened actually. And if you look at remove blur, see how it's like spiked way up here? Let's bring that down to maybe halfway and let it re render. And there it is. Now it's still not looking quite right to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that lens blur and put it on auto and restart from there because that one looked the best before I went to motion blur. Yeah, that one, I mean, it's it, we're splitting hairs, but that looks pretty good. So there's before and there's after. Now there really isn't no, any noise here, but if there were, I'd move noise to the right. There aren't any artifacts as well. If it had artifacts, they're like, little pixels that are kind of like pixelated, uh, usually on edges. So on an edge, you'll see them somewhere. Um, usually like a blurred edge, uh, but I don't see any of those here. So that looks pretty good. So let's just say this is good. Now, what you may want to do is only apply the sharpening to the subject and not to anything else. If you do, you could mask it. The masking is very effective. You can see right here where it says select. Right now it's off. If I roll this open, as soon as I roll it open, it will turn it on and it will produce or develop a mask. And you can see it put the mask on and it found the bird pretty good. And it's applying now the sharpening to whatever is white on the mask. And that is the bird. And wherever it's black, no sharpening is being applied there. But if you look, it missed a part of the bird right here down at the bottom. So what we need to do is we need to add to this mask or refine it. To do that, click on the refine button. And we want to add to it. So we want to add. And you can see our navigation window. We don't have all of this part it missed encompassed inside of this navigation window. So move this down. You do have to wait for it to re-render every time you move it. Probably can't hear it, but the fans on my computer are going full bore. Because this is microprocessor and graphics processor intensive. So we want to add to it. I want 100% opacity. I want... 100% sharpening and added to this. If I had a part of the image that I only wanted maybe a little sharp, not as sharp as everything else, maybe I'd pull opacity down to 50% or something like that. If I was doing an edge like around the bird's head, bird's head and I don't want to bleed off into the background, I'd have edge aware on. I'm not really doing an edge here, so I'll have that off. And just like that. And if it was on, you have a sample area that, and if you click this little like uh, question mark, change the distance edge aware looks for edges, the distance. So this is basically the kind of the feathering for lack of a better term. So if I go up here, see how it's heavily feathered there. And if I go down and see how it's not heavily feathered, that's all that is. But we're not going to use edge aware for this. We just want to add, we could change the size of the brush with the size slider, or we could use the bracket keys. The right bracket key makes it larger, left bracket key smaller, and then come in and just paint right here on the part it missed. Like that. It looks pretty decent. All right, now we're done refining our mask. Just click update. It will update the entire image. All right, it's updated. Looks pretty good, looks pretty sharp. I think we're ready to go. So we're gonna click apply. And you'll see a process the image. It's given us a countdown here. And if that's in seconds, it's totally off because it's going a lot faster than that was indicating. And it will open up again now into Photoshop. And you can see there's our sharp image. Let's do a before after. There's before and there's after. Let's fit it to screen. Command zero. Control zero on the PC. There's before and there's after. There's before and there's after. Now, I mentioned if you need to re edit, if you thought oh, I overdid it or I didn't add enough, just double click on the words Topaz Sharpen AI and it will reopen this layer in Sharpen AI and you'll be able to take up right where you left off. I'm not going to waste time doing it here, but just trust me, just double click on Topaz Sharpen AI. It'll open up back up into Sharpen AI. Now, if you want to go back in and do something in Camera Raw, you want to. You know, I didn't add any saturation to this, right? You could go up to filter and you could go down to camera raw filter and add saturation there. You could always add an adjustment layer or you could just go up to image adjustments and you could go through here and go to vibrance or hue and saturation and add it that way as well. So there's a lot of different ways 
you could edit it from this point forward. And by the way, if you opened a non-RAW file up into Photoshop, as I mentioned at the top, it won't open up into Camera Raw automatically. It'll open up into Photoshop. If that's the case, duplicate the background by hitting Command or Control J, and then go up to Filter, and then down to Camera Raw Filter, and then do your Camera Raw edits, like I did to the RAW file. Do any Camera Raw edits you need to do to that file that you're working on that isn't a RAW file. And then once you're done there, then send it, make sure you have a smart object, send it into Topaz Lab Sharpen AI, and go from that point forward and you're good to go. So that's how you use Sharpen AI as a plugin in Photoshop. Again, I have all three of the videos done for Denoise AI, that is as a standalone app and as plugins in uh, Lightroom and Photoshop. And I have the video done for Sharpen AI where I demonstrate how to use it as a Lightroom plugin. And the next video I'll be doing is demonstrating how to use Sharpen AI as a standalone app. Then we're going to tackle Gigapixel as well. And again, all these videos will be in a playlist and that playlist is listed in the description below this video. Thank you everyone who watches my videos. I really do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon.